Man. Is it recording? Yeah, you I guess so. Okay. Well, Susan said it to record. If you want oh, to get man. a little closer, yeah. And then this is how I share my screen. And then when I share my screen, it gives the option to share audio. Oh, oh I didn't see that last time when you did it. My parent probably told me. Oh, maybe it's okay. I didn't know shit. So now we can't talk bad about people if we're recording. Yeah, there's. <laughs> Thanks. Uh -huh. Oh, change my name. Oh, wait, here it is. Never mind. Everybody's using their school. I know. I, I, I feel bad. Yeah. I have to joke about that. I think there is a way I can change. Nah, don't worry about it. I mean, I, I don't care. Oh, <laughs> apparently Brad just changed his. You're doing the exact same thing we were doing, changing our screen names from our kids to us. It was cracking me up. Like, there we go. You're doing the exact same thing we were doing. Okay, I don't think I'll need it. Okay. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can do that. Good morning. There we go. Hello. How's it going? We're doing good. How many miles did you run today, Kevin? Ten. He ran 10 miles, so he's like, already oh, done. Oh, wow. You got it in, Kevin. And the rest of us. But my first was a five-mile warm-up for the five-mile race. Five-mile warm-up before a five-mile race. My goodness. Okay. Go for it. Today was race day. Oh, today was virtual race day. Okay. Oh, wow. Virtual road race series, right? Mm -hmm. So. That's great. Hey, Daisy. Good for you, buddy. Hey, good morning. Apparently, Kevin and Randy have discovered that when Kevin gets stressed about work and thinks about work, he runs faster. And when Randy thinks gets stressed about work, he runs slower. So <laughs> apparently, that's the difference. So Kevin has been having some of his best times lately, and Randy's been having some of his slowest times. So I thought that was a, a funny running. He did okay today. <laughs> but Kevin's <laughs> weekly runs have been going a little faster than normal. Mm -hmm. How are you so, doing, Rebecca? You all right? I am. I'm enjoying this Judaism study, and Jay's class got a new kid on Friday. Oh, wow. That's great. Another so trying to email me. Now they're giving new students t-shirts, which is nice, because that way they have one for Spirit Day, so the parents yeah. aren't running around yeah, like yeah. with chickens and stuff. So Tanya just emailed me and said, hey, we sent this bag home. Can you just text the mom and make sure they're doing good? And I was like, sure. So. And they have three sections, right? No, that's the third grade. Jay's third only grade, has two. Okay. Jay's is pretty okay. small. Um, okay. Yeah, Jay and Jay, I think we have the, our kids have the two smallest classes at Woodland. Oh, wow. <laughs> and they're both very boy heavy classes. Mm -hmm. Very boy heavy. Yeah, they ran all the girls off. Yeah, the boys scare the girls, so they're, they, they've gone. But, um, <laughs> so yeah. Uh, so Charlie got these lights. What do you call them? LED lights. LED lights that he has a remote control and he can change the color. And so now he has a chair, a couch, and a bed, and these LED lights. And I walked in to tell him good night last night, and I feel like I was walking in his dorm room. And I was like, I'm not ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like purple lights, like this big glow in his room. And I was like, okay. He may never leave his room. Yes, he, he loves his room. So anyway, that's, that's, what we're, that's what we have going on at our house. We don't have anything me up. exciting to report here. <laughs> What? We don't have anything exciting to report here. Uh, well, Charlie spent his own money on these lights, so it was a big deal. So. Oh, yeah. He invested his own money in it then, yeah. He did. His birthday money was spent on it, so hey, y'all. So, yes, when Charlie gives us, but he was so funny. He got $20 in cash, and he wanted to buy something on Amazon, and he goes, well, how do I do it? It was almost like he thought, like he couldn't fathom in his mind, like he wanted to put, yeah the twenty dollar credit to Amazon. Here, put the twenty bucks to Amazon. I'm like, you don't do it that way. Yeah, and we were like, well, just give us the cash, and then when we pay for it, like he couldn't fathom like how cash and Amazon work. That well, was he knows Amazon credit. He's got that, and yeah. he knows Amazon gift cards. Yeah, exactly. 
So, so we finally were just like, it all comes to us anyway. Just give us the cash. And you know what they should invent? You just made up, because Jake's done the same thing with me. Because oh, has he takes he? his okay. grass cash and he'll give it to me in exchange for for the, mowing the lawn. For mowing the lawn. Oh. So it's money I've given him that he gives back to me. And, and I will then go on and use my card so I can purchase something on Amazon. Yeah, that's true. So what we need to create and invent is something called Kids Cash. And what it is, is it's a, we're going to invent, you and I all invent it, Rebecca. It's, it's a, like a Bitcoin or something? It's sort of like Bitcoin for kids. Oh. And then it's for grass cutting. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Boom. I'll, I'll put it in your little account and then you can then exchange. I don't know. Maybe we've invented something. Well, somebody sent me a link to something like that. It's, it's a kid's debit card. Oh, my goodness. And you can control, you can, you know, obviously put money on it. And then you can control their spending, see what they're spending it on. Oh, there you, that's well, you know, and limit it if you had to. <laughs> oh, great. Of course, there's a limits. monthly fee for this service, which is a little excessive, I think. But, <laughs> oh, so they get to hang on to the cash oh, and charge you a fee. Interesting. So, but yeah, so he spent, I was just telling them that Charlie is obviously becoming a middle schooler because he ordered LED lights for his room that go around the top. And it has a remote control and he can color they are change color and it fades in and out. And I was like, okay, walk into my seventh grader's room last night. I felt like I was walking in his dorm room. It was just a really weird feeling. Like like a rave going on. And I'm like, people can't even come into your room. This is COVID. Like, yeah. it's not like anybody's going to oh. see your room. But it, it looks cool on Zoom calls. On oh, Zoom calls and well, FaceTime. That's, so, that's what we're going for. Yeah, so we have reached a new level in our, our household. So, yes. So. That's where we're at. So welcome, Candace. It's good to see you. Hi. Good to see you. My husband is here too. He's just in search of coffee. Oh, good luck. I don't <laughs> know how it is. Right now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but he'll be here in just a minute. Yep. And Susan and Michael, y'all are driving to Minnesota? I don't know if Susan can hear me. Where are y'all driving to? Oh, she's frozen. <laughs> you are going to Minnesota. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think y'all are in Arkansas, Missouri, Boot Hill, because the uh, it, it, you're going in and out a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> for a little bit. No worries. We'll wait a few minutes. Um, I think Brooke, uh, Brooke and Anthony should definitely be coming on. So. The closest one I could find was that yeah, Melanie did email me back. And she said that she'd love to join us, but she's <sighs> stuck in soccer. Oh, okay. Stuff. Now. Melanie Koo. Okay. Yeah. So maybe it's okay. Well, good. Graham's here too now. Hello, Hi, Graham. Hey. We got kids running around in the background, so. Oh, good. Well, <laughs> yes. No judgment from us. <laughs> I like your pictures. Those are really cool. Oh, thank you. Those are my. That's my father and my uncles. So we've got Air Force, Clemson, two Citadels, like a Clemson Citadel, Air Force, Annapolis, I think. Wow. So, wow. Yeah. Very neat. Pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Kevin uh, has hung them twice, once when we were married and once when we were dating. And so he said after he hung them the second time and got them all in a row that he was done. In the same layout. <laughs> same layout. They had to be all spaced out. So they've been up there for 15 years. They're not moving. They're not moving. So you will see them in our house for a long time. So if and when that room ever gets painted, I'm not sure I can talk him into it again. So <laughs> yes. This has been our backdrop for quite a few Zoom calls. I like it. We're at the, the room at the church. Our kids um, started the, the kids Sunday school last week. Oh, good. Week. Yeah, so we're like, well, we'll just, we'll come up here to the regular room and bring our iPad and, you know. <laughs> well, good, I'm glad to know it's working out because it's all a work in progress here. Yeah. So. So yeah, this is week three of our Judaism study. Susan did week one. And then of course, the way our class is, um, we got about a third of the way through my slides last week. So, <laughs> so <laughs> we'll, we'll see, see how many slides I get through today. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully we'll get through more, but it's been, a, um, it's been a fun study. You can definitely go down the rabbit hole when you start studying a world religion. It's, uh, yeah. it's easy to not know where to stop. <laughs> Susan knows. She, she did. She did like all of the Jewish history in one week. So. She, yeah. Oh, wow. She, yeah. That's a lot. Yeah. It was a lot. I, and a lot to stay away from the rabbit holes, right? <laughs> well, I'm excited to learn. So we'll wait a few more minutes. Usually Brooke and Anthony come on board. 
So. I'm scared. Well, our boys have officially been in school eight days. Yeah. So every day's a gift. And Jake is at Woodland too. So we're eight days in. Awesome. Have you started yet? Call your, I don't know. I know Michael and Susan's are doing virtual. Oh, that's right. We started, um, well, Braxton started Monday and Thatcher started Tuesday. So, okay. and then he, he didn't have the full day of classes until, well, he still hasn't had a full day. He had most of his classes on Friday. They're just, they're easing into it, learning all the tools, learning etiquette. You know, so, and then he's had a lot of getting to know you assignments. So, same with oh, Braxton. Yeah a little work but um but it's a lot of just learning the tools so yeah it is it's a whole new thing it is it really is. but it's gone well so. yeah, the city of memphis they said they're doing a stress test for the internet on thursday morning because with all the ninety thousand city of memphis schools kids coming online they're have literally doing like a sort of like an internet stress test like thursday morning with the internet providers and making sure that the internet can handle those additional 90,000 kids online during the day. Because I mean, that's a lot of, a lot of internet a lot of bandwidth. bandwidth mm -hmm. So those 90,000 kids are already on the internet. Yeah, they'll find that there's no difference because they were already on it, but you know, at least they're <laughs> testing it out. So we'll see. Ours are in person. We're at Christ Methodist. And um, last week was their first week and they went the whole week. And it seems like everyone, it was a little bit of an adjustment as I'm sure it was for everybody. Yeah. Um, we got to, we got a lot of, I miss mommy. I miss daddy. You want to be home <laughs> at the beginning of the week. And by the end of the week, they're like, let me tell you about our new friend. Jenny is my new friend in class. Webb is my new friend in class. Oh, and so God. It started to They're adjusting to the mask pretty well. Um, yeah. To nobody's surprise, Charlie did not eat lunch one day because he was too busy talking to somebody. So he came home and <laughs> of course, in the middle of all of this, I'm so paranoid about somebody being sick that when he said he didn't eat, I was like, what's what? And then I was like, oh, it's Charlie. He talked all the time. So, <laughs> but they're six feet apart. So the talk is, he's twisting his head well, around. Or, 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 well, yeah, they're six feet apart, but then they're long ways on the table as well as the side. I mean, they're distance in two directions. Yeah, he got he has a total of maybe two people he can actually. Yeah, play. he's opposite ends of eight what eight foot tables, I think. I think so. And then there's a big distance width wise, so lunches aren't as fun as they used to be. I don't know how they're doing it for <laughs> ours. Um, they well, you know, they. Except Agnes, the they're staying in their classrooms and eating at their desks, or they're eating outside on um on beach towels, is what Hope said. I think, yeah, I think ours are in their classrooms, and from what I understand, they're breaking the class into even smaller groups of three and keeping them together for like two weeks. Yeah, and then that makes sense. To help them get to know more people, they mix up the groups two weeks late, two weeks later, or something like that. And so sometimes they're yeah, I'll keep talking. I'm gonna try to try something out. And sometimes they're. I, I thought they said sometimes they're going outside, but I'm not sure. It'd be great if they were. Um, yeah, some fresh air. Sure. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay. Last week, I could not see y'all. I could only see the person talking when I shared my screen. So Charlie gave me a Zoom lesson this week. So of course, he was the one that did. So, um, so we'll go back to where we're going to start today. Where did we start? We stopped at uh, the Sabbath. Yeah, you want to close the door? Sure. That would be. Should we get started, y'all? Yeah, I probably should. But there was something. Okay. Wasn't there a question where we stopped even? Though? Yeah. Well, there were some other that? questions, oh, but okay. this was one of the main ones. So uh, we're going to get going because I know that we'll talk a lot. And this was this was sort of a little, little venture off. But one of the questions that came up last week was just, um, so last week we kind of just talked about the structure of the synagogue uh, and for Candace and Graham, a big topic that any of y'all can speak up to well, is if, before we get started, what time does uh, children's Sunday school end for you guys? Because y'all, I mean, yeah, what time do y'all have to pick up the kids just so we know? Because everybody else I believe is home. it's 11.45. Okay, I so think... you got, we're fine. We got an hour. Okay, okay. okay. Right. Um, so basically we talked about the structure of a synagogue. Um, a big topic of conversation among a lot of us college football fans was the fact that you pay membership fees, you don't tithe, there's no um, offering plate at a Jewish synagogue. And one way that they raise money 
um, is, I think I've got this back here. Ah, a couple of places back. Um, one way that they raise money is you can purchase reserve seat seats for high holy holidays. So that got quite a response from our group last week. <laughs> so um, you can imagine. So that was that was a big response last week. So we kind of kind of went off on that. So we just kind of talked about the different structure and different things like that. Um, but out of this um, came a question about um, just kind of world religions and the numbers of people in the world. And so um, there's an organization called the Pew Research Center. They're pretty trusted. Matter of fact, I wrote down technically they are a nonpartisan fact tank that informs the public health about issues. So it's a it's a trusted source um, and something that I felt very comfortable with. And um, so the last studies that I could find were back of 2015. So I know that's not very new, but it was the best it was the, the best source that I could find in the most recent. Everything else is 2015. So I would imagine something's probably coming out around this year. So I thought we'd start globally and just kind of do a real quick overview. So, um, so on the left, just to kind of over here, the circle, that's percentage of the world population. And on the right is the numbers. So if they look a little bit different, it's, it's kind of similar, but still it helps you see. So as an overview, um, as of 2015, they're saying that 31% of the world are Christians, 24% are Muslims. Um, you've got a lot of unaffiliated, i.e. atheist, Muslim, a atheist, oh, so agnostic. Atheists are in the 60s. I think so. Okay. Um, unaffiliated. Um, Hindus, then you've got Buddhists. Uh, but what's interesting is here, we're here doing a study on Judaism, and Judaism, Jew, uh, Jewish people make up 0.2% of the world's population. Wow. So if that kind of helps put it in perspective. So um, I think it does kind of help us when we're doing this study. It's such a big part of uh, Christianity and the Bible and the history and everything we've been doing. Um, but it really does kind of put it in perspective. Um, at least for me, I live, we live in East Memphis, really near several synagogues. Um, so th there's 31% Christians, 0.2% Jews. And then over here on the right, and part of this is obscured on mine, but this is just talking about the estimated growth. Um, and Kevin, you can't see it, but um, I, but basically they're just saying that uh, compared to the expected population growth, that Muslims are going to grow at a higher higher rate. Christians are going to kind of keep up the pace, and then every all the other religions are not going to keep up the pace with the world's religions. See, I always thought Muslims were higher than Christians. So this is interesting. They are, but they will be, or or maybe they are now. They're yeah, and they may be now. Could I be. mean, no, but that's that a was percentage to make up. But yeah, I mean, and what do you know? What folk religions are? Um, I think I did say? some research on that, but I can't okay. remember. Okay. I remember, I remember thinking what it was. Did I put it in my? Maybe like Taoism, like that. Huh? Like Taoism and probably. Uh, yeah, like... I remember doing some research on it, and I couldn't find an answer that. Okay. And okay. I, I should have. I'm just curious. Yeah, I remember. That can be more. So. Yeah. So. <laughs> But anyway, so I can't, like I said, I should have, I should have done some of that. Okay, so the next one is on um, the landscape of religion in America. So again, this was 2014. So um, this is basically, it's a little bit of a different view, so it kind of takes you a minute to look at it. So out of 100 people, this is what America looks like. Um, but you can see that a lot of those are Christians. So... Um, You've got 47 Protestant, including evangelical and mainline. And I did do my research on evangelical Protestants. So what they consider evangelical Protestants, or at least what I could find after spending way too much time trying to find a list of, of evangelical Protestant churches. Um, the main ones are Southern Baptist, non-denominational Christian churches, uh, Church of Christ, Church of God. Um, I think I put Church of Christ down there twice, so I apologize. Assembly of God, Seventh-day Adventist, and then just that Christian church, which Kevin always finds it interesting that that is an actual denomination, and there is a denomination called the Christian church. Or is it a Bible church? Is that the same thing? I don't know, but there is a Christian church, and then there are just churches that are Christian. Susan, am I wrong there? You look like I maybe. Church is also the disciples of Christ. Maybe that's, maybe that's it. I would consider that yeah. evangelical. I would consider that mainline. Mainline. And I could be wrong, but that was just, and like I said, you may know more than I do, but that was just, so I don't know much about them. 
is. But yeah, usually if someone says I'm a part of the Christian church, they're referencing the disciples. Disciples of Christ. Okay. It was it was hard to get a good list of that. Okay. So anyway, that was um, just to kind of give you an idea. So for every you know, if you include the Catholics and the Protestant and the Protestant, you know, all of that, and look at down at that, and about 2% of U.S., so, so compared to 71 Christians per 100, you get about two Jewish people. So I do think it's important that we're doing this study on Judaism to kind of remember that, um, to kind of, it kind of puts everything in perspective. Um, and then it just talks about, we talked a little bit about this, the fact that mainline churches are, um, mainline Protestant churches are, de are declining, so it just kind of talks about um, the declining share, um, and the non-denominational churches are, are growing. Mm -hmm. So, um, would that be considered the, yeah, affiliation? thanks for l looking this up, seeing the numbers. Um, I don't know exactly what I expected the total Jewish population to be, but this is way, way, way smaller than I thought it was. That I was mean, my takeaway. 10 um, million people on the globe being Jews is a shockingly small number compared to the 2 billion plus Christians. That, that's really interesting. And I wish I could have found one a little bit later. I mean, I'm sorry that the latest I could find was 2014, 2015. Um, it looks like they're done about every five years. So we'll probably, probably in two months, I could probably find one from 2020. <laughs> um, and, um, and this, I felt, this was a source I trusted. I trust this, this organization. Um, obviously, when you start looking up numbers, you can you, you can really make numbers do anything you want them to, and we all know that. So, um, but this was a source that I trusted. So, um, but I would agree, Anthony. That was something that really kind of kind of shocked me um, in a way, um, especially because I think we get so into it. And so, anyway, that's just something. So, okay, we're gonna go on ahead. We're gonna move to life cycle celebrations. Okay, and if I'm moving doing stuff on here, it's just because. Um, I have to kind of be able to read and see all at the same time. Ah, sorry. Okay. Charlie would say I'm not doing my Zoom <laughs> lesson very well. Okay. Um, so right now we're going to go ahead and move into the life cycle celebrations because I feel like they're very important. Uh, this was interesting for me because I have a Christian education background. And so looking at it through the lens of Christian education and looking at it through the lens of Judaism have been a very interesting thing for me. So, um, they really, the biggest takeaway for me is um, in the Protestant church, we have two sacraments. We have baptism and communion, but Judaism does not have sacraments. Um, they are, these are just considered just rituals. They aren't necessary things that you have to do. You can still be a Jewish person if you don't go through these. Um, but, so they're not something, they're not a required part. You don't have to be a Jew, Jew, Jewish person to do this, whereas um, our sacraments are considered a little bit different in the, in the Protestant church. Um, they're holy, they have to be carried out by, you know, you have to be ordained. Um, like at the Methodist church, I had a master's of Christian education. I could not perform baptism and communion because I was not ordained a, as, a, as an elder. Um, same kind of thing in Presbyterian church. So um, it's considered very holy. So in Judaism, it's a little bit different. Um, but really all of these life cycle celebrations are, um, I would call them rites of passage. Um, and the bris, which we're going to talk about in just a second, is, is probably the one that's the most different from that. Okay, here we go. And speak up anybody that needs to has something to say. Um, so, and I keep doing this so I can read. Okay, um, children are born pure and free from sin. And I'm going to get a little specific here. And if I get a little, I don't know. I just have to get a little specific here. So it's just the way it is. An unborn child has the status of potential human life until the majority of the body has emerged from the mother. And the reason that's important is because up until that child is born, the mother's life is considered a life and that baby is considered a potential human life. So the mother's life is always con is considered more valuable until the child is born. So um, they really, potential human life is not the same as human life. So why, where the mother's life is in jeopardy because of the unborn child, abortion is mandatory because the mother's life is life compared to the potential human life. So then once the child is born, it's, they're both equal, but until that point, it's not. So 
um, like I said, I don't, I don't want to get too specific into that, but I don't really feel like you can talk about birth and life without talking about that aspect. Um, again, that's a rabbit hole we can go down and I don't really feel like we need to. Um, then we're kind of leading up into the, to the breasts and the birth celebrations. So after a child is born, the father is given the honor of an aliyah, an opportunity to bless the reading of the Torah in synagogue at the next opportunity. At that time, a blessing is recited for the health of the mother and the child. If a child is a girl, she is named at that time. A boy's name is given during the Brit Mala, also called the breasts, which is a ritual ceremony. So there's a little difference here, well, a big difference here. So uh, the boys have to go through the ritual circumcision. So there's a whole nother ceremony. For the girls, pretty much the, um, this blessing and the, the naming of a child is, from what I can understand, you know, as far as the rituals, that's kind of the extent of it. Obviously, you're celebrating the birth. But it happens within eight days, right? The boy's name. Is given well, we're going to talk about the breast. Oh, sorry. We're going to talk about the breast in a second. So any questions? I may not. Hopefully, I can answer. I'll probably end up writing them down and getting back to you next week. Yeah, I guess okay. one, one question on, sorry. Go ahead. With the abortion topic. Yeah. Um, so I wonder, do, do you know if the um, kind of this concept, like if there's a direct tie in their written word, or did this become a, I'll say kind of a tradition? Or you know, I'd have to look and see if there's specific scriptures that tie into that. Um, there's a whole lot of my study about life is really valued. Um, we talked a little bit about the Sabbath last week. Um, Sabbath rules are put on hold where anything where saving a life is concerned. If you're a doctor, you go and save a life on Sabbath. So anything regarding the value of human life supersedes these other laws. So um, even, I was even reading where like, um, you know, if there's holy days where you fast, um, if that may be in detriment to a, a, a pregnant woman, you don't fast. So life is considered very valuable. Um, so there's a lot about the value of life. Um, I don't know if I really answered your question, Anthony. Um, yeah, but, just thinking, you know, Christianity, you know, I think there, there's specific references in the Bible that, you know, and I'll kind of butcher this, but that, um, that life begins before this point. Um, right. A lot of people kind of cling to that uh, specific references and mm. choosing how they feel about abortion. So th this is just really interesting that this is kind of a, um, a departure from a lot of what I've heard. Uh, well, and that was kind of one of the reasons I wanted to bring it up. Like I said, I don't want us to go down this whole, mm -hmm. um, but, but the point at which a, a life begins is a very important topic. And so they had a very specific time in which human life begins. And I had never really heard that term potential human life. That's just a, a very specific phrase. Um, so that was um, a lot about that. But, um, but yeah, it's a lot about the value of life. Um, and then also, as you see here, we kind of went over it, but the child, children are born pure and free from sin. So, um, you know, typically in the Christian nominations, we do want to get a child baptized, uh, especially in the Catholic church um, very quickly. Um, and so I think that's a little bit of a difference that maybe we haven't really talked about too much, but the children are born pure and free from sin. So that's a little bit of a difference. When do they flip? Or are you going to cover that? That's a good question. I don't know. I mean, I really have to do some research. Okay. Again, I apologize if they'll ask me questions I don't know the answer to. I promise I spent hours and hours on this. Oh, I know you did. But <laughs> so, um, okay. So we're going to get to the breasts. Uh, here we go. That's all I can say. We just, okay. Okay. One of the commandments in Judaism, the Brit Malah, literally the covenant of circumcision, probably one of the most universally observed. Even the most secular of Jews who observe no other part of Judaism almost always observe these laws. Of course, until quite recently, the majority of males in the U.S. were routinely circumcised. This doesn't seem very, very surprising. Okay, I'm going to show a video. Hopefully, y'all can hear it. If you can't, please speak up. Charlie gave me my lesson, so we'll see if I was a good student or not. When a Jewish baby okay. boy is born, he is initiated into the community through a long, long, long practice tradition known as Brit Milah, or Bris, which represents the babies and the Jewish people's covenant with God. The central act of the ceremony is circumcision, 
which is typically performed by a trained professional known as a moil. Note to Jewish parents. Different moils have different manners of practice, and you may want to research and perhaps interview the moils in your area to find the one you feel most comfortable with. In addition to the ritual act, a newborn ceremony includes some blessings, the formal baby naming, and, you guessed it, a festive meal. This is an ideal time for parents to share with their community the values with which they intend to raise their child. One modern custom is for the parents to read a letter to the child out loud in front of the guests. Dear Max, you are named for your great-grandfather Moshe. I did the wrong thing, y'all. Sorry. Let to hit escape. Okay. Let's go back over here. Okay, go, Kevin. All right. So is, so is this performed at the synagogue? No, we're going to get there. Oh, sorry. Okay. So the commandment to circumcise is given in Genesis uh, and Leviticus. So like, um, so I'm just going to kind of just read it. Um, it is commonly perceived to be a hygienic measure. However, the biblical text states that the reason for the commandment is quite clearly. It is an outward sign of the eternal covenant between God and the Jewish people. Um, it is performed on the eighth day of the child's life during the day, and they are performed on the Sabbath. So that is important because certain, like weddings, as we will see in a minute, are not performed on the Sabbath. The circumcision is. And a, a Jewish boy uncircumcised is still fully a Jew, but it's not in compliance with traditional Jewish law. So um, it's, again, one of those things that's highly suggested, and it's really a part of it. Um, they did talk a lot about the fact that this, I guess, and they reference a lot of, like, U.S. customs have often kind of, uh, kind of gone in with to Judaism, and the big fact that it's so accepted in the U.S., it makes it one of the most commonly done rituals of Judaism, partly because people living in the U.S. is accepted. So it's not considered different. Um, I found the video, and that, by the way, that video, that website has a lot of videos. It's, it's um, a group of Jewish people that have done lots of different videos. It's a really interesting, you'll, we're going to see a couple other videos. Um, first, as a funny thing, I thought how they handled the circumcision was very nice and <laughs> sweet, and how, how they did that in a very, very nice way. Um, but I really thought it was interesting how to choose the person who does that. So that was a really nice way of saying, hey, parents, do a good job. You don't want to choose the wrong person to do your child circumcision. So uh, to answer your question, I think the breast can be done at home, um, right. but I'm not exactly sure. The reason I ask is because the mother is not allowed, is it, is it true that the mother can't go? Um, the mother's ritually unclean. Unclean for 30 days. A lot of that then. goes, and people, anybody speak up, Susan, feel free. Um, and I did make a mistake last week, and I do want to say it. I was wrong. Reform Judaism is the most liberal, then there's conservative, and then Orthodox is the most conservative. And we're going to get into that. I was, I was wrong, so I want to apologize. So it's Reform, Conservative, Orthodox. So different um, levels of Judaism do different things. So as far as the ritually unclean and the women, I didn't see a whole lot of that with the bris. Uh, there's a lot about the, the men really taking the lead on the bris, although that video showed a lot of women being involved. So I think a lot of it's are you talking to an Orthodox Jew or are you talking to a Reformed Jew? Like, I think there's some differences there. Um, and I think Susan and I are planning to get really more into the specifics of that at the end of, I think that's the last week of our study. Um, so it's, it's kind of hard, like, what comes first? Do we talk about the divisions and then the life cycle events? Or so, um, but. Um, I do think, anyway. I do think the bris is typically done at home. Um, yeah. We have some friends who are Jewish and Lauren got to attend their son's bris, which was interesting. Um, <laughs> performed by an orthopedic surgeon. Orthopedic. Uh, but, so Candace, uh, your dad you know, could do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Is it we can save some money, I think. I know. <laughs> <laughs> These circumcisions. We could have done it for free. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so uh, but yes, it is supposed to be done, I think, within eight days. Yeah, it, on the eighth on, day. On the so eighth very day. specific about that. Um, and as we know, with, if you've had a boy, you want to have it done earlier because it, it, they don't, it's not as painful for them when they're little. So, I mean, for a practical standpoint, there's that as well. Um, but just a lot of what I read is it is, a, um, it is one of the most commonly done rituals today. Um, and then we'll get into the bar and bat mitzvah. And so some of these are, it's been really interesting doing my study, like you've got 
the, uh, the biblical meaning for it. And then you've got what we as a culture, especially in America, have changed it, especially gatherings or um, you know, things that are just part of culture. So, okay, the bar and bat mitzvah. Um, and again, I have to minimize y'all on my screen so I can read it. Okay, um, bar means son, uh, bat means daughter, and mitzvah is a commandment. So basically you are uh, heeding a commandment. Technically the term refers to a child who is coming of age. Uh, they are, and so technically you should say they are becoming a bar or bat mitzvah. Um, it's more commonly used to refer to the coming of age ceremony. And again, the way we use it, you're having a bar mitzvah or we are invited to a bat mitzvah. Okay, bar and bat mitzvah. First I wanna say, I did a lot of research on this. Um, pretty much, Reformed churches do bar and bat mitzvahs. Basically, all the churches I can find do it, and even Orthodoxes do it to a certain degree. Um, when I was doing a little bit of research, kind of a fun little fact, Corby Trotz's wife is the president of one of the local Orthodox, seminary, uh, Orthodox synagogues, the one near me over here on Yates. So that led me to believe, okay, well, if you've got a woman who's president, Orthodox is fairly open to women. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of really what led me down this path. Mm -hmm. I was like, if I'm a woman president of the synagogue, my daughter's gonna have a bat mitzvah. I don't know about anybody else, but that's just the way it's gonna be. So to, to research it, um, a lot of the, um, even the Orthodox, Orthodox synagogues do bat mitzvahs as well as bar mitzvahs. I'm sure there are more conservative groups and we, Susan and I can get into that at the end, um, but by and large, it happens for both girls. Um, we can read over this, but I will just say overall, kind of the feeling I got in all my research is, it's kind of become more of a cultural thing and a party, and it's not really that big of a deal religiously. It's become more like I read a, a, um, a letter from one of like a, an Orthodox rabbi's wife, and she was like, to us, our bat mitzvah for our daughter wasn't that big a deal, but all of our family came in and everybody wanted to come. So it's almost like become more of a cultural thing. So to, to her and her husband, who was an Orthodox rabbi, it was... Um, not as seen as big of a deal as it is culturally. So I don't know if anybody, feel free to speak on that, but that was just kind of but what. I think, I think the, the kids, don't they, I mean, they, I think they study for like a year to learn Hebrew to go up there. I mean, I know it's yeah. a process. It is a big process. Um, and it's basically the equivalent of in our church, they're joining the church. I mean, the only thing you can kind of compare it to is they're doing confirmation because it's happening about 12 or 13. Yep. And upon reaching that, they have all the rights and responsibilities of a member of the synagogue. So um, that was the, really the thing that I could, um, I could equate it to. Um, again, it's another rite of passage. Um, so, um, okay. But depending on the level, I guess, it's more religious for some than for others. I mean, so I'll just read this. So children are not obligated to observe the commandments, um, you know, until they have are conferred the right. So at age 12 for girls and 13 for boys, they become obligated to serve the commandments. So this is a process in which they are saying we are ready. So it publicly marks the assumption of that obligation. Kind of like in our church, when you are, when you join the church through confirmation, you are now considered a member of the church. And you have all the rights and obligations that go along with that. So um, along with that, they have the right to, to lead worship services. Um, there's this thing called the minion, which is basically like a quorum, for lack of a better word. You have to have a minimum number in order to do certain things. So they can be considered a part of the minion. Um, so it's just all of the things to become a fully functioning member. Um, again, and I, sometimes I feel like I'm not qualified to speak on this, as even though I've done as much research as I have. But... Um, they're saying, some of the studies say that you don't have to have this ceremony to mark it, that you automatically become it 12 or 13, but I really think the ceremony is really needed. I think that's not as, um, as popular an idea. Um, and um, they're saying that this, this, the party is a relatively modern thing. The ceremony um, is, is more of the traditional thing that you get up in front of your synagogue, um, but the elaborate ceremonies and receptions that we have today are a fairly, fairly recent thing. Um, so anybody have a lot more experience with this than I do? I grew up in a town with no Jewish people. So I'm sure a lot of you have a lot more experience than I do. <laughs> <laughs>
As I told them last week, I had a cousin who married a Jewish person in Philadelphia, and that was a big deal. Oh, my gosh. So, <laughs> um, so I've, I've learned a whole lot. Um, but a lot of it was just the ceremony is required. The party is sort of an American, you know, uh, American thing. So, um, so any more discussion? Anybody? I haven't even been to one, so I'm sure some of you have. Children. I mean, it's interesting that they get more binding contracts at the age of thirteen. But in the in, in our in the Protestant Church, I mean, technically, when your child is confirmed, they are a member of the church. Yeah, but they that's, vote that's on more of a legal thing. Yeah, but I mean, that's. I mean, we all know they're not going to do binding contracts, okay. but in the okay. views of the synagogue, they are a fully they are a fully formed member of the church. Nice. Just like in. The Presbyterian Church, when you go through confirmation, you are a mm -hmm. member of the church. And it's, I kind of view it similar to, at least for me, I always as a Christian educator, I always view confirmation as that's when the child takes it upon themselves and said, I believe. Until then, it's kind of what your parents believe. So I feel like this is a point where now, obviously, a child wants to have a big old party. So they're probably going to go through it. But in theory, it's when the child says, I am ready <coughs> to do it. Um, although in most Protestant denominations, it, it's not a certain age. Like at the Methodist Church, we confirm the sixth grade. The Presbyterian Church, we perform in eighth grade. But it's not like when you turn 12, when you turn 13. So there is a difference there. I feel like in the Jewish faith, it's a little more, like I said, automatic. It is, you are 12, you do this, you are 13. Whereas in our tradition, it's a little bit different. It's more grade specific. Yeah, and just... Even churches do it at different ages. Like in the Methodist church, some do it at sixth grade, some do it at seventh grade. Um, I don't know a lot about the Presbyterian churches because I went to seminary for Methodists, but um, it's just kind of kind of that way. So, okay. Now we're going to get to views on marriage. I not what time it is. We're doing good. Okay. Um, anyway, I'm just going to go right into it. Okay. Okay. Um, I thought this was just kind of interesting, so I want to talk about it. Refraining from marriage is not considered holy as it is in some other religions. On the contrary, it is considered unnatural. Uh, the Talmud could says that says that the unmarried man is constantly thinking of sex. So that's just what it is. So, um, and I can't even read all this because of my screen. So the Talmud tells a rabbi who was introduced to a young unmarried rabbi. The older rabbi told the younger one to not come into his presence again until he was married. <laughs> So um, I, I shared that and I kind of thought about maybe not sharing it, but I wanted to share it because that is so counterintuitive to um, like the Catholic views on it. So in the Catholic tradition, you know, the priests are not married because so I, I thought that's just an extreme view, different view. So that was one of the reasons I felt like that was worth sharing. Um, it seems a little silly, but I thought that was really interesting. Okay. Traditional sources recognize that companionship, love, and intimacy are the primary purpose of marriages. Notice that a woman was, uh, it's, not, it's not good for a man to be alone. So it's a little bit different. I mean, oftentimes we hear of marriage um, being for procreation, but um, in the Jewish tradition, a lot of it's more about companionship, not just procreation. So there is a little difference. Okay. And not to get religious, but I knew this would come up, so I did my research. Okay, the reform and conservative movements endorse gay marriage and have gay rabbis. Orthodox rabbis on the whole do not perform same-sex marriages, and there are not, I think there may be one person, one Orthodox rabbi who professed, who said he was gay after he was, he was, he went through the process. So they as a whole do not endorse it. Um, so reform being the most liberal, so reform adopted it first, because they are the most liberal, then conservative came on board, and then orthodox. And also when I'm talking about this, just to give you a little bit of background, that helps me. Temple Israel is reform. They're over there near Lausanne, they're all from Massey. Mm -hmm. I had, this is the research I had. The conservative seminary, I mean seminary, synagogue is on Kirby at Humphreys right across from, from the um, Opera Memphis. So mm -hmm. you know where that is, where Kirby dead ends into Humphreys. So that is a conservative synagogue right across the street from Opera Memphis. Then over here, Kevin and I live in East Memphis. So right off of Yates, there are two conservative synagogues. Uh, one's right on Yates, and then one is like you go across Walnut Grove, and it's kind of up against 240. It's kind of hidden. Um, I think that one's actually even more conservative. Um, the one right here off of Yates is, um, is orthodox, but it's not as conservative as the other one. So I just say that to put it into context when we're talking about these different 
Oh, thanks. And Chuck, you mentioned last week something was interesting. I did try to research it. So Chuck mentioned last week that Orthodox synagogues um, have a certain area in which you're supposed to live in to walk. Um, again, you could go down the rabbit hole. <laughs> There's lots of different things, but by and large, it's point, it's six tenths of a mile that you need to live in. Um, and that's the area in which they consider it okay for you to walk. Well, I think we have an Orthodox one over here on Yates as well. Then. Well, there's another thing over here on Yates, and Kevin and I often wondered what it was, and it took me this study to look it up, but it's called Young Israel. So it's actually <laughs> kind of set up in our little house. So yeah, I is, couldn't sure. figure out exactly what it is, but it's called Young Israel. So I don't know if it's just meant for younger families or whatever. Well, but they're all walking. Yeah, they're yeah, all walking. They all, they all so walk. we live in a community yeah. where a lot of people walk. But um, And then there's lots of rules, and as y'all can imagine, those rules about travel have changed with the advent of cars and there's just, it, you can really, there's a lot of it, but the, the thing that I really found the most was that six tenth of a mile thing. Like, so, like there was a, something written by a guy and he goes, somebody let me borrow his, mountain, his cabin and they said it was a 10 minute walk to the synagogue and he's not Jewish so he didn't understand and it wasn't a 10 minute walk. So he was like conflicted about trying to get to the Sabbath because he was on vacation and it was further walk. So can they ride a bike? Well, maybe the mountain cabin didn't have a bike. Well, I'm just, I'm just saying, I mean, that, that, we always assume that they walk, but I mean, couldn't, you know, a bike doesn't create fire. Yeah. I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But, but thanks for that, Rebecca. That's interesting. I didn't know the distance. Yes. But, it, but it's interesting, like I said, if you go, it's something about towns and there's something like even within a town and if towns are connected, then maybe that, that it's almost like they don't want you to go in through the wilderness. There was like some reference to that. Like they don't want you... I don't know. There's just a, like I said, there's just a lot, but the six tenths of a mile was the best, the, okay. the overarching. That makes thing. sense. Yes. Um, and I found the whole views on gay marriage to be very similar to kind of what we've been going through in the Protestant churches. Um, and if you think about PCUSA and, you know, our different um, groups within the Presbyterian church. Um, so, uh, but reform really came on board pretty early, conservative a little bit later. And then the Orthodox, um, I think they're still kind of struggling with it. And even within the orthodoxy, there's an orthodox union, and then there are different groups of orthodoxy. Um, so I think it just kind of depends on where you go, as we all know. Um, probably similar to other places. Um, more urban churches, maybe are a little different than more rural. Okay. I'm going to have to minimize y'all so I can read this again. Okay. We're going to spend some time on this just because it's interesting and of course, everybody's always interested in weddings. So there are two levels of, um, of the marriage contract, if you will. Um, there's the Kiddush, Kiddushin or Kiddushin, and then there's the Nisuin. Um, and these have been combined, but I just want to give you a little bit of history. Basically, the Kiddushin was an engagement, and it was a binding contract. They really were, they, it was bound. Um, and that was considered the time where you're getting ready for marriage. And then the Nisuin is actually the com completion of the marriage. But before these two would occur as much as a year apart, today they are form performed together. And in a second, uh, we'll go over the actual marriage ceremony itself. Um, but, but basically it was, it was a binding engagement and then the marriage. And now those are just, like I said, they're just combined into a ceremony. Um, a, a rabbi is not required, although, again, in reference, in deference to kind of societal norms in the United States, um, rabbis are often officiated, and also due to uh, the law, the U.S. civil law, you need to have a religious or a civil official. So, again, they could have a judge perform it as well, but it's very similar to the U.S. You've just got to have an official do it, so a rabbi um, does it. Um, and in my research, talking about the Sabbath, um, well, we'll talk about that in a second. So, um, okay. Um, just kind of basics. The bride is veiled. The ceremony lasts about 30 minutes. The first part is the condition. Uh, I don't even know how to say it. Kiddushin. Um, and it just kind of talks about kind of the way that's done. Um, after the Kiddushin and the, the ring, then they do a ketubah. And I'm going to show you this video and hopefully that'll work. I thought this was just interesting. I didn't want to do a whole lot of videos on, um, but yeah. You could spend months learning the ins and outs of what makes a Jew. Well, that's me. That's not it. That's not it. There we go. 
Jewish wedding tick. Everyone has something to say about it. The Bible, rabbis, legal codes, this guy. The Ketubah is a pretty short, straightforward document, often handwritten by specially trained scribes, that condenses all of that down to the rights and responsibilities of Jewish partners to each other. It's not about love, although many couples choose to embellish the traditional text with additional, more romantic flourishes. Two honored witnesses sign it before the wedding ceremony. Though the Ketubah is thousands of years old, it was way ahead of its time. It states clearly that a husband must provide food, clothing, and other responsibilities. It also spells out financial arrangements in the event of a death or divorce. Adding their own twist to the tradition, some couples append their own vows. It's a beautiful custom to hang up the ketubah in the home, to remind everyone of the beauty of the wedding and the commitments made. Okay. So, that is just part of the ceremony. Um, but I thought it was, I really liked it. I love the idea that that's a framed thing that you get when the service is over. I really like the sentimentality of that. But that's just one part of the service. Uh, but I did, I just thought that was a very important part because it really um, is a lot of the ritualistic and, and the wise. Um, and then after the Kaduba, um, they were, the bride and groom recite seven blessings um, in, a, in the presence of a minion, which is that word came up again. It's a, a quorum of 10 adult Jewish men. And again, that's what a boy who has been bar mitzvahed can be a part of that quorum of 10. I do have to say that when Kevin heard two people sign it, he thought it said 200. So I was like, no, not 200, two people sign it. Um, and then they smash the glass. Um, and we're gonna talk about that. And the smashing of the glass symbolizes the destruction of the temple. It's just something that is done. Um, okay. Um, I thought, and I've heard of this uh, happening. I've never been to a Jewish wedding. Uh, the couple were ret retires to a, a private room, um, and it's just a few minutes uh, where they just kind of have a few minutes alone, and then they go on to the reception. Um, you know, a lot of times, like we did that. We went to a private room. I didn't know that was a big deal. We kind of just went to a room and waited for everybody to leave the. Well, probably do so. uh, Maybe we are. Um, so they stand beneath a huppa. Um, a huppa is a canopy held up by four poles. It is a symbolic of their dwelling together and of the husband's bringing the wife into his home. Um, they can be held in a temple, but as long as a huppa is present, um, they can be held anywhere. So that's why I, I intentionally put a picture of the ceremony being held outside. Um, they cannot be held during Sabbath. Um, and they're often not even held on, and uh, many of you have probably been to Jewish weddings, so please speak up. But, um, they're typically not even held, if they are held on Saturday after sundown, um, it's pretty late because if the service lasts six hours, that's a while. So many Jewish weddings are held on Sunday just so that um, they can start earlier. So those of you who have been to Jewish weddings, this is your time to share or, or so. Um, okay, this is just one of those fun little things that, you know, we always ask about. So I just thought I would go ahead and do it just like we talked about the yarmulke last week. So um, it is a consider considered a commandment to make the bride, uh, bride and groom joyful. So basically it is just another manifestation of that. So while there's no actual source for the lifting of the couple of chairs, the Talmud records that there was a custom for some to hoist the bride and, bride and groom, uh, the bride on their shoulders. So the Talmud basically said, the rabbis said that uh, they should do it on their shoulders. So they just lift them on the chair. So it's just kind of something that has, has come about. Um, this does not seem to be, again, one of these great commandments. It's just a way of making the bride and groom joyful. I think it's just kind of a ritual as we often have it at Christian ceremonies, just things that have kind of lasted. Um, there's even a whole video on how to dance the, 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 uh, the song. And so if you are going to a Jewish wedding and you want to know how to dance it, you can find a video so is that it, you're prepared. Is it just one song? I mean, is it a specific song? Uh, well, there's a, a, a like the chair dance song. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, um, okay. Can't do this without talking about divorce. So, because <laughs> we're going to talk about marriage, I have to talk about divorce. Um, <laughs> it is just a very accepted thing. It's not considered anything negative. Well, I mean, it's not considered uh, it doesn't really have any like negative connotations. Um, they maintain that it's better for a couple to divorce than to remain together in a state of constant bitterness and strife. Um, sorry. So it, it was just seemed very matter of fact. There wasn't a lot of, and my mother would say, gnashing of teeth about it. It was just, it, the, the concept has been around for a while. 
it's accepted and they'd rather you move on with life than, than be, be, ups, be upset. Okay, so we have to get to death. Okay, gosh, y'all, this could go on forever, but we're gonna, we're gonna dive in. So I kept putting off this week because it was hard. Um, it is, it really, they could view it as just a part of life. It is, um, they, they do believe in the afterlife. They believe that, you know, when the Messiah comes that we will all be brought back to life and we will celebrate there. So there's a little bit of hope there. Um, they do a really good job of mourning and we're going to see a short, a three minute video. So I apologize about the videos, but they can do a better job than I can. Um, and I, I, when you're viewing this, I mean, I think they do a really good job of, um, of talking about, of just realizing that people do mourn um, and that you do need that time. Um, I think in the time of, I don't know quite how they're dealing with this in the time of COVID. So that may be something interesting to think about. Um, having lost my father four years ago, I do like a lot about this, the Judaism. Um, there's a, a whole week, as you will see, where it is really acceptable for that immediate family to fully mourn and not have to do daily life. They really, the community comes around and supports them. And so there's a lot of that that I really, um, I really appreciate. And I think they, I think they do it really well. So three minutes, and I promise this is the last video. The death of a loved one is a very disorienting time and isn't something many people think about it until it's actually happening to them. Judaism offers structured periods of mourning that help provide some support in the grieving process. Jewish tradition is to bury the dead as soon as possible. The period from the time of death until the funeral is called aninut. After hearing about a death, immediate family members may tear a piece of their clothing this ripping is called Kriya. You're tearing a hole in the fabric of your normal life. Many do Kriya at the funeral. During Aninut, many people don't know what to say or do. Sometimes they ask mourners, is there anything I can do? They get the automatic response, no, I've got it under control. If you're a mourner, accept help. It's okay, you have a lot to plan and a lot on your mind. If you're a friend, offer to take care of errands, grocery store runs, or the dog. It gives you a way to connect with the mourners and help in their grieving process. Meanwhile, traditionally, a Hevra Kadisha, or burial society, takes care of the body. You can find one through a funeral home or synagogue. As swiftly as possible, the funeral happens, sometimes the next day. Afterwards, friends and relatives bring a meal of consolation to the mourners. Unlike normal meals, where you are a gracious host, at this meal, the community takes care of you. Then Shiva begins. Traditionally, it lasts for seven days after the burial, and is an intense mourning period spent at home by the immediate family. The first 30 days after the burial comprise another period, called Shoshim can go outside the house. During the Shloshim, some people will go to concerts or parties, wear new clothes or shave. And for the children of the deceased, the entire mourning period, called Avelut, lasts for nearly a year, during which mourners recite a prayer called the Mourners Kaddish daily. At the end of Avelut, there's an unveiling service to place the tombstone at the grave. It's a time to remember again, to close this intense part of the cycle of mourning. But we never forget our loved ones. Four times a year, there is a special Yizkor service in synagogues to remember all those we've lost. And each year, on the anniversary of their passing, we say Kaddish again and light a Yortzeit candle in their memory. To learn more, there are four more videos in this series. They discuss caring for the body, Sorry, the funeral, <laughs> shiver, and how to say the mourner's Kaddish. Um, so I apologize for another video, but they could just, they did it so succinctly, much better than I could have. Um, it was interesting. We, like I said, we live fairly close to several Jewish synagogues and I, uh, there was a lot of cars around the house around the corner and we quickly realized they were sitting Shiva that the, um, the, uh, like the mother-in-law or the grandmother had passed away. So, um, it is very interesting. Um, 
and spit, feel free to speak up about things you like or don't like. I just love the fact that the morning family is taken care of. Um, you know, in our traditions, it's a lot about bringing food and that's about all we do, but it really is a lot about taking care of. And uh, I really like how they said, if you're grieving, accept the help. You know, we're so ingrained to just say, I can do it, I don't need any help. Um, and I just think they do, uh, um, I think all of the rituals around that are just really beautiful, to be honest. I think they do a really good job of that. Um, and um, when you are grieving, you don't really know what to do. So and I think it would almost help to have these, these certain things that are just things you do. So anybody has anything to say on that? Um, we'll, we'll go through some of the specifics of it. Um, so they talked about this um, in it and we won't, I mean, I won't spend a lot of time, um, but it just kind of goes through the different things. Um, the Ananute, um, which is the time right before the funeral, and, you've got the funeral, uh, and then you got Sheva, um, and they really do. There is a most church, most synagogues have a group of women. It's almost like a funeral council. Whereas we have a group of women who cook and bring you food. They have a group of people that really support you during that time, um, and you are really not supposed to do anything. Um, they will they will take care of you. Um, and then um, there's a 30 day period. Shalashim, um, people. The end of Sheva really really marks the end of the formal mourning. Like, it's kind of like, we've given you a week to really mourn. And then there's this other 30 day where you really kind of go, it's like slowly getting back into work, um, getting back into life, but uh, you avoid parties, concerts. Um, maybe this is a bad example, but you know, technically, traditionally in the Protestant world or the Christian world during Lent, we don't really do anything big and fun. We don't celebrate any big party. So in a way, the Shellachim kind of reminds me of that a little bit. Like we're getting ready for the death of Christ, they're getting over the death of a loved one. They're just not going out and doing anything. They're not partying. They're not doing doing anything big. Um, and then the first year of mourning is mostly just for the child of a loved one who passed away. And basically every day you say the mourner's prayer. Um, and then on the anniversary, no matter who it is, um, they um, say the mourner's prayer. Um, so we uh, through a lot again, more today. Go ahead. We have friend uh jewish friends who uh his well actually both of his parents died believe it or not within a week and um he actually did not go to movies or concerts or parties for a year okay the, um he's um reformed temple wow. israel that's unusual but, yeah he described to us that that at least for him because it was his parents um that he he honored that for a whole year. Mm -hmm. That's yeah, interesting. I guess it's his choice. I mean, it's, it, it's yeah. a person's choice too, right? Yeah. It may not be required. But. And it, he probably didn't feel like it, to be honest. Like if I was yeah. with my parents in a week, you know, in a way it kind of gives you that, I, I don't know, you're able to mourn and people recognize that. Like they're not going to force him to go and do anything because he's still, still mourning. Right. Um, right. So no, I, I really, I really understand that. I really love that idea of this group of people coming and supporting these people. I never really understood Shiva until researching this, and I really think it's just a lovely idea. Um, yeah, and a lovely, I agree. Um, it is. It that that's a really nice tradition. Yeah, and I, I just remember when my dad died. Like we were so in this. I we traveled to South Carolina, so I think it kind of made it a little bit different from me because I was actually traveling, but. I remember thinking the world has stopped for me and the world keeps going on for everybody else. I just remember that idea that like my world has stopped and really I feel like this kind of honors that and they recognize that the world has stopped for you and we're going to support you, you in that. Um, and I even like the 30 day period. It's sort of gradually, you know, kind of reintroducing yourself to society for lack of a better word. But the difference for you too was and people kept stopping by and you felt like you were their host, right? That's a very good point. And this is different in the fact that, you know, you're allowed to mourn for that. <laughs> yeah, I don't get the idea that this was Shiva and they expect you to talk. And even if they are bringing you food, I don't think you're expected, like Kevin said, to be their host. They're there to support you in your mourning. Um, so. But there was something very comforting in people talk, stopping by to talk about dad and to talk True. about their memories of him. So I'm not discounting that. And doing whatever they thought they could. Right. right? I, mean, I, I get it. So. And I'm not saying the way we do things are bad. I just think that this is a very, um, it's just very interesting. And I think it's a very nice way of doing it. Anybody else have anything else to say? 
Okay. Well, we actually went through this a lot faster. Apparently, the discussion of paying membership fees and paying for reserve seats at <laughs> Washashana uh, gather a whole lot more discussion than marriages and funerals in our in our group. And how large is the Jewish population? And how large is the Jewish population? So, big, big um, questions last week. So, but these are just things that we kind of needed to go through, um, and um, I find it, you know, they're just things I feel like. Like, like Chuck said, you know, he knows people who have gone through this. We are going to encounter, even though they are only 0.2% of the popula world's population in Memphis, we are going to encounter people that are going through this. And I think it's helpful um, if somebody says Sheva or if they have someone who's passed away, we at least know those terms. I think it's very important. Um, and, um, you know, my children don't go to school with anybody that's Jewish, but I know several kids who go to school and they've been, like their president chairman, they've gone to bar and bought mitzvahs because of classmates. So, you know, our children will encounter people. Um, so it's helpful for us to know so that we can have those conversations with our children as well. I, I will just mention, um, Lauren ran into a, a lady who owns a small business who's Jewish and she's on this team of women who prepare the body for burial. And it's, so it's not normally done by, you know, funeral homes. It's done by a group of volunteer women. And then there's a group of men that do it for the men and the oh. women do it for the women. Oh. And, and of course they do, you know, they bury them swiftly. But so when somebody in their, I guess in synagogue or in their community dies, then they, th those women get together and then they prepare the body the, of the woman. It's just interesting. It's very, and they don't embalm. So that's why it has to happen right. within 24 hours. Right. Um, yeah. So, but, um, you know, it makes you wonder, you know, growing up in a small town, everybody was a member of a church, even though we'd never seen them. Well, this is a group of volunteers who does this. So somebody who's not actively a member of a synagogue, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of logistics that have to be worked out there. Um, so it could be that, like they've written in that video that, you know, your funeral home can put you in touch with someone. So I'm sure there are, there are ways, they've got ways to do it. Um, yeah. But, um, but I know I think I think the way they handle deaths is just really beautiful. And but did y'all notice? Um, I didn't point it out, but like the uh, the caskets are not supposed to be anything big. They're just very very simple. They don't make a big tradition of that. It's just a, a very simple pine box or something like that. So it's supposed to decompose. It's supposed to decompose. Um, so it's um, just something very simple. So just some differences between between our because oh, yeah. um, our yeah, just a lot of differences. Anything else anybody want to bring up that we've discussed? Anything I've missed? I have one question. Okay, um, if I don't know the answer, I'll find it. Yeah. How, how do they feel about when they are encounter a prayer group? For example, um, you know, you're at an event that, that is with a, a majority of Christians. You're a Jewish person. Um, and let's bow our heads. How does how does that uh, treat it? I'm just kind of curious. I, I was thinking about that the other day because uh, encountering a friend, uh, baseball team prays before or after the the team meets. Jewish uh, person is has, is in the team. Um, how how do they feel about that? Do, do we know or any thoughts on that? I don't know the answer. I have. Does anybody have any thoughts on that? I'll just kind of throw that out to the group. I guess I could do some research on it myself too, but I was thinking about that the well, other I mean, day. You know, there's a lot of talk about prayer before sporting events and that, yeah. you know, that kind of affects that. I, I don't know. That would be interesting to find out. I mean, they, they do believe in God. So praying is not foreign to them. Shouldn't be That's offensive. True, yeah. But if they, you know, if, if, it, if they're praying to Jesus, <laughs> right, they might, right, you know, yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I have to do some research on I that. I guess. that well, it's the same thing if you're Muslim or Hindu. They pray to a god, but they don't pray to Jesus. So yeah. it would be a very similar thing, I would think. Mm -hmm. I feel like I feel like most most of the time I run into that, people are very deliberate about trying to make it non-denominational, right? It seems like most of those bow your head things that I'm a part of, they don't talk about Jesus at all. It's just kind of a general higher power sort of thing. Right. Yeah. Um, I mentioned last week when I worked at Emmanuel Methodist, we were in a group with uh, Holy Spirit Catholic, Brown Moral Prez, 
uh, the Lutheran Church in Temple Israel. So we always did a Thanksgiving service because that is, that's not, that, that, that's not New Testament. That's, you can talk, and so we did a lot of Old Testament readings. And so all, everything was really focused on the Old Testament because it, it was inclusive. And so there are ways you can e easily do that uh, without, you know, not being Christian, but you just focus on the Old Testament part and you focus more on that. So there are a lot of ways that you can do that. So, um, and then, I mean, there's lots of things you could talk about, you know, is it okay to say Merry Christmas? But, you know, is the view if they, somebody says, you know, Happy Hanukkah back, then we're just expressing our views. I mean, there's just a lot of things, you know, you're not being negative. So, I mean, and I'm not trying to get political and I'm not trying to get anything. There's just lots of, I mean, there's lots of different things, ways you can think about it. Well, Beck, I think you did a really good job of tying this whole message of the value of life together from the oh, very thank beginning. You. Well, from the, you know, with, with birth, and, well, marriage, birth, the whole process and all the different celebrations throughout life. And then particularly upon death, that time and, and effort and energy taken to remember a person <coughs> and valuing the life. I think you did a really good job of tying that all together. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's why I really wanted to get, yeah, I wanted to stop last week before we started with birth, because yeah. it's really a, it is the life cycle. And I think it needs to be treated as a whole. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah. as a person who did a lot of study in Christian education and seminary on um, uh, rites of passage, I think the, Jew the Jewish traditions do a really good job with the rites of passage. Um, I think those are really important. Um, it's way more you, practical um, than I, it's way more practical than I thought, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it's, yeah, it's all these different milestones, really, it, they seem to all really be focusing on this, this whole message. So. Yeah. Oh, and you all did mention COVID, um, how is it affecting, and I did research into our local synagogues, um, that was something else I did. Yeah. Basically, from what I can tell from their websites, they're handling it very similar to the way we are. Um, a lot of them are doing it, you know, technology. A lot of things are canceled. Um, but there are a lot of things, um, you know, that are being done um, uh, via, via websites and things like that. The conservative synagogue had a really good video. They have a, a, woman, a woman rabbi, a female rabbi, and she had a really good video looking toward the High Holy uh, festivals, which... Susan and I are going to get to later, but basically just saying we are making preparations on how you can celebrate that at home and still be a part of it. So right. she did a really, really good job. And I, I thought, wow, are we doing <laughs> like that? It was just really good. She really addressed it. And having looked at four or five different synagogues websites, I was really impressed with her. She, um, so, and just FYI, it was interesting. I did research on her. So she is married to the rabbi at the Jewish home. So the conservative woman rabbi at the temple across from Opera Memphis is her husband is the rabbi at the Memphis Jewish home. So I thought that was kind of interesting too. That's a little aside, but um, having been somebody who was interested in being possibly ordained, that was really interesting to me to see how a married uh, rabbi couple could figure that out. So they moved here from New York to take those two jobs, um, but she did a very good job. So they are trying to figure all that out too. So we're all just figuring it out and Susan and Michael are on the front lines of all these websites trying to help these churches, churches navigate it. <laughs> so Y'all probably know about what, more about what churches are doing than anybody. Um, but she did a really good job. So, well, Susan, I'll be in touch with you this week and we'll figure out what we're gonna, the next couple of weeks, who's gonna do what, what our schedules look like. Sounds good. So, any other comments, questions? Um, I think we rec we're recording this and I think we're going to send that out. If y'all have any questions, again, that website, um, I will kind of just look at a couple of references. Um, it's interesting, the, there are really good references out there. There's the one of the websites I looked at and Susan had too, was called Jew, Jew FAQ. And it's, um, it's a woman and she's just a reformed Jewish person and she's just done a, a lot of work. Um, and then um, the bimbam.com has all the videos um, that I found. Um, and then um, my Jewish learning, that was a very easily accessible uh, website that I found a lot of, a lot of research on. So um, there's, uh, it's amazing what all the, the different sources are out there. So, okay, well, I guess we need to do prayer request and then we got, y'all gotta pick up kids really quickly. So if y'all need to leave, Candace, I know y'all gotta pick up kids. So if y'all need to go, um, go right ahead. Um, any prayer requests, anything that we need to discuss? Thank you guys, Thank thanks me. Okay, yeah. bye y'all. Thank you. Oh, I'm glad you could join us. Yeah, us too. Okay, see you next week. Okay, I'll stop my screen sharing now. I can figure out how to do that. Ah.
No, we'll just continue this way. Yeah. So, uh, so any prayer requests? Anything we need to? If I, right, okay. School going okay for everybody. Everybody, at whatever level you're doing it, home, virtual, combination. Yeah. Uh, so far, so good. Yeah. Kind of how we feel. So, just yeah. getting back in the routine and and figuring it all out. Yeah, Pr pretty good first week. So grateful for that. Yeah. Absolutely. That's too. It's been really good to get some semblance of what I used to know. You know. <laughs> Chuck, not to pry, is Miller going in in Collierville, or what? what is the school doing? Yeah. Um, as you know, it's a small school, but they are doing they are doing five days. Awesome. And then there, there's also a virtual option, and kids can, you know, dial in or whatever and watch what's going on in the classroom. But he's, he went every day, and mm -hmm. there's been a lot of time outside, and it, it went well. So Awesome. How about your son? Same. Really yeah. good. They're back in person. Their school offers a virtual option that keeps keep going in. The protocol's really tight and right. And I mean, it's a little tiny school as well. And they they really figured it out and spent a lot of energy and effort into, into making it right and communicating protocols and answering questions and putting a lot of information out, which, is, which has made it, you know, a little bit more, well, a little less anxious you know, for us and knowing that they put a lot of time in it because we've seen all that communication. Doesn't, doesn't make it perfect. And certainly there likely will be a case, frankly. I mean, I, it's the, I, mean, I, I don't, there's no other better way to say it. Yeah. But to right. your point, I think, and, and we're also in a similar situation with an only child. I think it's been um, a real blessing for the last eight school days for him in particular, because uh, I don't know if it would be helpful at all if, if we didn't have that in school option. I, and I think it's appropriate that there's a choice too, because, um, you know. It, Everybody's in a different set of circumstances. Yeah, the only that's child that's thing, that. especially, you know. Yeah, everybody is in a different set of circumstances, um, but he definitely wanted to go back and yeah. yeah, understandably, you know. So yeah, grateful. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it is interesting for those of us whose kids are in school, like they're still not able to talk as much as they normally would. It's just a different setup. But you know what, considering the other options, I think, you know, it's it's good. You know, yeah. but the six feet apart in the mass, they aren't quite having that same conversation and interaction, but it's so much better than being at home. Um, yeah. Because uh, yeah, our boys are at Woodland too, but I call, I say every day's a gift. I don't know how long it's going to happen, but every day's a right. gift. <laughs> We're just going to take it as long as it lasts. Exactly. Exactly. Um, that's kind of, yep. My mother, I think, has finally calmed down. She was really, really nervous. And now that we've gone a few days, she's kind of calmed herself down a little bit. So, um, but she's also not watching the news as much. So that helps her, helps, helps me when she's not watching the news all the time. So that's good. Yeah. But, so anything else that we need to, to, to bring up? Any, any prayer requests or anything? Um, I think the next lesson, Susan and I are going to get together. We're going to talk about the high holy days um, and um, within the Jewish tradition. So that'll be next week. Um, and then um, after that, we'll get more into the, we'll go really more in depth into like the reform, the orthodox, the conservative, and then some of those smaller groups, including Messianic uh, Judaism, which is, will be an interesting topic. So, uh, but that's kind of next. Well, Becca, I had a question uh, um, because I haven't seen or talked to him. Has anyone heard from like Tom, Kate, how is he, how, how are they doing? You know, I was thinking about them because I'm going to reach out to Cindy. So I need to find out. Has anybody heard from the Cateses? No, no. I don't know. Yeah. That's, um, a, that's a great question. Yeah. Yeah, we need they, to find out. Do they email, do you know? They I, do. I've never forgotten a response. Oh, yeah, they email. Okay. I actually... <clears throat> Let me text Tom because okay. I've got his I've got his number. I'll text him. Okay. Um, that would be great. I, I was thinking about them last week, wondering how they're doing, but I'll I'll text him. Yeah. But yeah, but yeah. Uh, they yeah they definitely email. Um, I will mention my colleague in Little Rock who has COVID and pneumonia, who got it at church. Um, but that's because they. Long story, their church was not really practicing what they should have been doing um Do they have a big gathering or something yeah they, you know they were just kind of meeting like normal uh, uh eric uh, it, no eric's um 
gal he works with who works for him. Okay. Uh, one of one of my former colleagues across the hall has has COVID um, at home and not doing that good. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, I'm just going to close with some prayer, and and we will meet meet next week. Uh, Joe, Lord, thank you for letting us come together this week uh, to discuss uh, Judaism and all the life cycles and the value of life. I think it's really important for us to always focus on that, and no matter what our tradition is. And it's always interesting to learn about how different um, faith traditions uh, really honor um, honor that and honor life and and do all of those wonderful celebrations. And dear God, um, in light of life, we just uh, want to just lift up everyone who is battling for their life and and dealing with COVID in whatever way. Uh, We are all making the best decisions we can, Lord, and it's so hard and it's so stressful on all of us. Just ask that you just bless the people who are sick and those of us that uh, just day to day have to make decisions that uh, aren't easy. Um, I feel like every decision and that we make uh, just takes longer these days um, because we do have have COVID kind of overlying everything um, and to give ourselves grace and that we aren't always going to make the perfect decisions and Lord just help us comfort ourselves knowing that we are making the best decisions that we can um, that you are right there beside us as we walk through um, this uh, very unusual journey so um, until we meet again in your name we pray amen thank you thank you thank you thanks a lot Rebecca thanks it was fun thanks David. So, okay bye y'all Bye. Bye.